If you haven't been with us, we're working our way through the book of Mark, the second book of the New Testament. If you have your Bibles, you can turn up to the passage of Scripture in Mark chapter 7 today. That's where we find ourselves landing this morning. I remember just a few years ago, it was in the Daily Times that they reported this story. It was reported about a guy who had been arrested in our town for shoplifting in Portsmouth. He stole a ring from one of the department stores, and when he was asked by police why he stole the ring, he said he really liked the inscription on the inside of the ring. You know what it was? The inscription was four letters, WWJD. What would Jesus do? He stole a ring that read WWJD. What would Jesus do? And I couldn't help but think, well, you know, First, he'd probably start by praying for the ring instead of stealing it. But he's not, unfortunately, he's not the first or he's not the last to wear the name of Jesus without living out the nature of Jesus. I think one of the greatest temptations we succumb to is to substitute a cosmetic Christianity for a changed life, to wear a faith that doesn't square with the way that we live it out. And you know what? Hollow customs on Sunday are no substitute for the way that a person lives on Monday. God is just as interested in what you do out there as he is in how many times we show up in here. And that's oftentimes the problem. You know, throughout the years, unfortunately, I've come across, you know, people who preach what they aren't practicing. We often get loud talking down things we don't live up to. And we all battle with that. Well, when we come to the book of Mark in chapter 7, we quickly learn Jesus didn't really have much tolerance for that kind of hypocrisy. And he doesn't mess around in getting his point across. He's bold, he's clear, and what he says is shocking to his hearers. Think of it this way. Imagine me telling this guy that he doesn't know anything about basketball, LeBron James. Or imagine me telling the next person, Patrick Mahomes, that he doesn't really know much about football. Or imagine me telling this person, Elon Musk, he doesn't really have a business mind. Or Carrie Underwood, that she doesn't know much about music. Imagine me telling The Rock that he doesn't know much about bodybuilding. In Mark chapter 7, Jesus is talking to the spiritual athletes, the spiritual elites, the spiritual bodybuilders of his day, the people everyone looked to as the goats, the greatest of all times at that time. And in this conversation, Jesus tells them, you guys don't know anything. And in the process, Jesus totally redefines, he redefines the heart of a pure relationship with God in a way that not only had massive implications for them, but for us today. So let's pick it up right here in Matthew, I'm sorry, in Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were unclean, that is unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews didn't eat unless they gave their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they don't eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with unclean hands? Now, to me, this is amazing. Because if you go back into chapter 6, you know what Jesus has just done? Jesus has just fed a crowd of thousands with a few loaves and fish working a miracle. Jesus has just walked on water. Jesus, in verse 56, has just passed by, and people have reached out and touched his garment, and they've been healed. And so these guys have a question. These spiritual elite, these leaders of their day, their question is not, wow, are you really the Son of God? Are you the promised Messiah that, was, that, was, that said was coming from the Old Testament? No, no. Their question is simply this. He said, why don't you guys wash your hands before eating? Really? Now, this had nothing to do with hygiene, by the way. 
It wasn't that they neglected to use enough bacterial, antibacterial soap. You know, your mom says, go wash your hands before you eat. It was a ceremonial thing. It was a ritual. These religious leaders believed that they were defiled when they didn't wash their hands in a certain way. And they thought, well, maybe I've come in contact with something that's unclean. So this cleansing ritual began, as most traditions do, with a worthy motive to remain undefiled and holy before God. But it, it soon became increasingly complex. There were even elaborate debates about such things as the position of one finger, one's finger as the water would pour over it. They would take a prescribed amount of water, pour it down from their elbows into their fingers, then they'd take the fist of one hand and rub it into the other one and rub it all the way up, and then they'd do the same and rub it all the way up. And they had a meticulous way of doing this ritualistic cleansing. And they expected everyone to do it this certain way. But it just wasn't a certain way to wash your hands. There were other traditions, and Jesus sort of refers to them here, about washing cups and pots and other utensils. They were traditions that, that they had basically turned into law. So Jesus looks at these guys, and he goes for the jugular. And notice what he says in verses 6 through 8. He said, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you guys. As it is written, you're hypocrites. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. Man, don't let anybody tell you that Jesus was soft. He drops the hammer on these guys. He says, you're a bunch of fakes. You religious imposters. You hypocrites. The Greek word for an actor back then was hupokritos, and it sounds like hypocrite, doesn't it? And what would happen, an actor would go off stage and he'd get a smiling mask and he'd bring it out and he'd do comedy lines. Then he'd go off stage and he'd get a sad mask and he'd bring it out and he'd do tragedy lines. And it was called a hypocrutos, which means hypocrite, one who wears a mask. He was an actor. And Jesus is saying, you guys are nothing but a bunch of mask wearers. Actors, you're more bothered by someone not keeping your man-made traditions than you are by obeying the very commands of God. And he said, you know what, hundreds of years ago, Isaiah the prophet spoke about you guys, you hypocrites, you religious fakes. Again, these are the spiritual elite of their day, and Jesus is saying, you're just a bunch of imposters. You don't know anything about what you're talking about. Now, in this passage, it's like Jesus gives us a number of warnings, and here's the first one. Don't make man's traditions more important than God's truth. These religious leaders had added so many rules and regulations to God's law that in the process, those rules and regulations, their thoughts and traditions, became more important to them than what God had actually said. For instance, you know, you had to wash your hands in a certain way. And that got me thinking about maybe some different ways that I've seen this fleshed out over the years in church settings today. You know, in just a little different manner, ways that we've made man-made rules just as important as God's commands. You know, there are some churches that, that have preached, uh, if you get a tattoo, it's sin. Or don't wear shorts to church. Or don't wear a hat in a church service. You can only use a certain version of the Bible. There's no eating in church. No pianos or organs in the building, some teach. Worship styles, you can only sing hymns. You can only sing praise courses. In my first ministry, we had started a junior church service in the basement of the church. And they went down there and they served the adults' communion. And one person got upset about it. He drugged those people upstairs and he stood them in front of the communion table. And everybody's milling around after the service and he says if I have the right to take the communion in front of this table they're going to take it in front of this table too they made the place of where they stand more important than what was going on in their hearts while it was taking place I, I did a little mini survey one time and asked some people what they thought were some barriers that we erect between people and Jesus one couple went to a church for the very first time one Sunday, and a few days later, representatives from the church came to their home to say to the woman, you can come, but you can't wear pants. We're glad to have you, only if you wear a dress. Another couple went to a church service one Sunday. The, husband's, the husband wore shorts because he had just had <coughs> excuse me, knee surgery, and they only attended one Sunday because they were told, if you're going to come here, not only is our service long, your pants better be long too, right? So one church building in our area a few years back had a sign plastered on the front of their building, nobody under 10 allowed to enter if you're wearing, uh, I'm sorry, no one over 10 is allowed to enter if you wear shorts. And I always 
you know, what are they doing? Checking birth certificates at the door or something here, you know? Now, I understand that there needs to be some parameters in the area of clothing. The Bible does say this. It says, you know, dress modestly with decency and uh, propriety. In other words, we don't want to draw attention to ourselves and dress in some provocative way. I understand that. I mean, you know, wearing a bikini to worship would not be appropriate, especially for the guys, right? (laughs) But wearing a Wearing a cut-off T-shirt to show off those abs of steel probably wouldn't be appropriate for, for Jeff while leading worship. So we got to use some common sense here. But I also know the Lord says this. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. When he looks at people, he lo- doesn't look at the outward appearance. He looks at the heart. So the question is not whether we have traditions, but whether our traditions conflict with the only absolute standard on these matters, Holy Scripture. Along those same lines, uh, I remember reading in a book one time, it's called Eat With Sinners by Aaron Chambers. And he was telling the true story of a young man who couldn't wait to go to church so he could praise God with other Christians. He had just completed a six-month tour uh, in the Navy in Iraq, and he, boy, he had a lot to be thankful for. And three months into his mission, he'd been rescued from the ocean after being knocked off the ship. So he was very thankful to be alive. He put on a nice polo shirt, a nice pair of shorts, a pair of sandals, and he headed to church. And he arrived late because he was from out of town. He didn't know where he was going. The service was well underway. It was packed. He finally made it. He grabbed the first available seat he could find on the back row next to a well-dressed couple. And during a break in the singing, the older woman leaned over to him and whispered, next time you come to our church, you need to dress more appropriately. And he sat there stunned and no longer joyful. Tears of sorrow began to well up in his eyes. And after sitting quietly for a few minutes, he leaned over to the woman and politely whispered, there won't be a next time. He left the service, went back to a ship, discouraged and brokenhearted. The point is this. Woe to us when we load down with burdens on people, things they can hardly carry that aren't actually scriptural truth when we elevate tradition over truth now we don't sacrifice truth we preach truth we don't avoid it we never sacrifice it we never put it you know a culture above it or popular opinion above it or what's easy or convenient god's truth comes in second place to nothing especially our man-made traditions But I think of scriptures, you know, like Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 and 27. It says, we're sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Clothed in what? We're clothed in his righteousness. So I don't care what lost people necessarily wear to church. All I care about is they're wearing the righteousness of Christ when they leave, when they see Jesus and come to him. Remember the story of the prodigal son Jesus told in Luke 15? Do you recall how critical the elder brother was when the prodigal son came home and they threw a party for him? And the elder brother, the older brother, basically was trying to spoil the party with his complaining and pointing out what he thought the father was doing wrong. God help us to stay so humble and appreciative in our salvation that we remain the prodigal son without turning into the older brother. Now, Jesus isn't done with these guys. He's just started. Look at verses 9 through 13 here. He says, you got a fine way of setting aside the commandments of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother. Anyone who curses their father and mother is to be put to death. This is Jesus speaking. But you say that if anyone declares what might have been used to help their father and mother is Corban, that is devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father and mother, and you nullify the word of God by your own traditions that you've handed down, and you do a whole lot of things like this. Now, just a little bit of background here to understand what Jesus is talking about. Jesus, God had clearly commanded, I mean, it's one of the Ten Commandments, right? Honor your father and mother. But these religious leaders had come up with a practice to basically get around that. The, the word Corban here is used about 80 times or so in the Old Testament. It's referring to an offering that was dedicated to God. People who wanted to hold on to their possessions would actually dedicate them as what was called Corban to God, meaning as long as they were alive, they could use those possessions and enjoy those possessions. But once they died, those possessions were given to the temple, to the place of worship. So here's how it worked. If somebody didn't want to provide for their aging parents, they would their possessions and call it Corban, 
They would say, sorry, mom and dad, I'd share with you, but I can't. My possessions are Corbin. In other words, they're dedicated to God, and they're going to go to the temple after I die. So blame God, not me. And this way, they were going around God's command to honor and help their parents while still lining their own pockets. They were following a a tradition that totally contradicted the word of God. It would sort of be like members of Congress passing a bill for the people while, you know, basically all it was doing was lining their own pockets. Not that that would ever happen, right? Here's warning number two. Don't elevate religious ritual over relationships with people. Now, again, we're not talking about God written down commandments and truth here we're talking about ritual it's like the story jesus told of the half dead man in luke chapter 10 we call it the parable of the good samaritan the guy's beaten up he's along the side of the road two religious people pass by and they leave the man lying there in his own blood he's a priest and a levite both religious leaders both could defend their faith neither one of them demonstrated their faith they had appointments to keep with the religious people. They, they had religious business to attend to in the temple. So they could perform their faith, and they just wouldn't practice it. So if you look back to verse 6 in this text, Jesus has something very interesting to say here. Jesus says, you honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. It's like lip talk without life transformation. And if we could think of a scale of 1 to 10, and 1 is just... Lip service we offer God, you know, and we say the right words in church service, or we sing the right words of a song, or we say the right words of a prayer. And, 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 but 10 is life transformation and change. Where are we at on that scale? Are we here, or, or are we more over here? Someone wrote the words, I was sitting at a stoplight this morning. The lady in front of me was going through the papers on the seat of her car. And when the light changed to green, she didn't obey its command. You know, a green light is a commandment, not a suggestion. You better get going. And when the light turned red again, and she still hadn't moved, I laid on my horn, screaming epitaphs, beating on my steering wheel. My expression of distress was interrupted by a policeman, gun drawn, tapping on my window. I said, you can't arrest me for hollering in my car. He ordered me in the back seat of his. And after about two hours in a holding cell, the arresting officer advised me I was free to go. And I said, I knew you couldn't arrest me for what I was yelling in my car. You haven't heard the last of this. And the officer said, I didn't arrest you for shouting in your car. I was directly behind you with the light. I I saw you screaming and beating your steering wheel. And I said to myself, what a jerk. But there's nothing I can do to him for throwing a fit in his own car. But then I noticed the cross hanging from your rearview mirror. The bright yellow Choose Life license tag, the Jesus is coming soon bumper sticker, and the fish symbol. And I thought to myself, that must be a stolen car. (laughs) Ouch. Don't block somebody's view of Jesus because you don't have enough love for him to honor the name of the one that you wear. But let me say this too. Just the opposite needs to be said here. If, If you're always pointing out the hypocrisy of others, If you've been letting somebody's hypocrisy or the hypocrite stand between you and God, in a sense, they're closer to God than you are. Set your sights a little higher. Listen, as Christ followers, we're blessed to be a blessing. God didn't add another day to your life necessarily because you needed it. He did it because someone out there needs you. We're blessed to be a blessing. Remember the passage I had Jeff read at the beginning of the service? He said there's two commands. Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. If there's a test for getting into heaven when we stand before God, I believe the first two questions would be this. Did you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Did you live your life for him? That's the loving God part. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. He gave his son to be our savior. The Bible says there's salvation and no other name under heaven other than the name of Jesus Christ, not Muhammad, not Buddha, not anybody else but Jesus. The second question might be this. What did you do to love, help, and serve others in my name? Because the second command was love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, did you live out your faith? Do you love God by accepting his son and living for him? Did you accept the blessing of salvation? And did that blessing, that love flow through you? It's almost as if Jesus is saying, I can tell the way you love me by the way you love them. Boiled down to its essence, Christianity is simply two things, love God and love others. And here's the thing, the second command is crucial to understanding the first. 
How can I show love to God? Sure, I can go to worship and read my Bible and give an offering, and, and I need to do all those things. I can close my eyes and I can raise my hand and I can shed a tear when a praise song touches me, but I can do all those things out of ritual, not really out of a relationship with God. Just because I sit in a doctor's office doesn't mean I can start just treating people. You know, hey, that, that mole here, I can take care of that for you and cut that out. No, I, just sitting in a church building on Sunday doesn't mean you're a Christian just by that any more than sitting in a doctor's office on Monday means you a doctor. There's got to be more to it. That's part of it, but there's more. And Jesus says, there sure is. The surefire way I demonstrate my love to God above me is by loving those around me. There's something about the way that we treat others that tells a whole lot about the way we love God. 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 and 21 puts it like this. We love God because he loved us first. But if we say we love God, we don't love each other. We're liars. We, we can't see God. So how can we love God if we don't love the people we can see? The commandment that God has given us is love God and love each other. Kevin Carter was a photojournalist in the 1990s. He took a famous picture that captured the human suffering in sub-Saharan Africa. The picture shows a young Sudanese girl She's weak and alone. She's trying to crawl to an aid station for food. And in the background of the photo, there's this vulture that's waiting for her to die. Sad. One version of the story told is that Carter waited some 20 minutes for the vulture to spread its wings because he thought the picture would be better. And when that didn't happen, he went ahead and took the picture without it. It's reported he took the picture, scared the vulture away, left the girl because something else caught his eye. And as the picture was seen by more and more people, he started to be questioned about the girl. What happened to her? Did she get help? Carter couldn't answer those questions. And as you might guess, people were severely critical. He tried to explain that people didn't understand what it was like out there. Suffering was everywhere. It surrounded him. He might be able to help, you know, like maybe one little girl in the photo, but there were thousands more just like her. So he put, took the picture and he did nothing. He ended up winning a Pulitzer Prize for the photograph. And then Kevin Carter went home and killed himself. I guess it's not what he did, but what he didn't do that he couldn't live with any longer. Jesus hasn't called us just to look out and see, but to step up and act. It's not that we have to focus on everyone around us, but sometimes it's the need that's right in front of us. Chances are that God's going to put someone in your life lens this week right in place of where you can, you, can, you can see them. They're clear. They'll be in your view, a neighbor, a coworker, someone in the hallway at school, somebody you see at Walmart, somebody who's hurting. And the only way that we're going to live this life in Jesus' name is if we can open our eyes and see them in a brand new way, if we put on the lens of compassion and become Jesus with skin on. So when you pray this week, pray with eyes wide open. Pray, Jesus, help me see people the way you saw people. When we do, we'll see what Jesus saw, and we'll feel what Jesus felt, and we'll have the opportunity to do something. Jesus had a heart of compassion, and if I want to know whether or not I have the heart of Jesus, I need to grasp this simple truth. Compassion, its test is action. So then Jesus says, I'm not done yet. He says, you guys think what defiles a person, what makes them unclean is just what is, is, is on the outside? You think if you eat the wrong things, it will make you unclean before God. If you get dirt on your hands, it will enter your body and defile you. He says, you got it all backwards. Look on down to verse 20 in our text. Jesus says this, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it's from within, out of a person's heart that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, and murder, this is Jesus speaking. Adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evil come from inside, and they defile a person. I mean, how alive, <laughs> Scripture is so true to life. We're so wrapped up in the belief in a little different way than what these guys were. If I just change some things about myself on the outside and just focus on the outside, 
I'll feel better about myself. I'll fix my problems. If I just lose some weight, if I get a new wardrobe, if I buy a new car, if I get a new look, I'll fix my problems. I'll feel better about myself. Think about the shows over the last decade or so. Extreme makeover, biggest loser. How about the phrases on magazine covers? Bulk up, slim down, smaller size, look great, perfect abs, better body. How about Botox and implants and tummy tucks? That's why we get facelifts and people send for late night information, uh, inf- infomercial products products like uh, abs of steel or whatever it is, the possibility of changing what I am and who I am is the essence of hope. And I think most people feel like there's something missing in their life. The problem is they're searching for it backwards. If I just change some things on the outside, I'll fix my problem and feel better about myself on the inside. But that's like trying to wash the outside of your trash can without ever taking the garbage out. That's like trying to hide the stench of a rotting corpse in the trunk of your car by just running your Ford through the car wash. Jesus says the problem's not on the outside, it's inside out. He says in verse 20, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. The problem we have is a sin, sick, broken heart. Jesus lists all kinds of sin, and his point is all these proceeds from the heart. Evil thoughts come from a heart, sexual ma- Immorality proceeds from a sinful heart. Theft comes from a heart of greed, a heart that's not content with what you rightfully have. Murder is an attitude of the heart before it's a physical action. And all the rest, they're all heart issues that start within. No matter how many times you wash your hands on the outside or you change something about the outside or you make yourself clean on the outside, uh, it doesn't change what's on the inside. But the good news is that's why Jesus came. He came to do for us what we can't do for ourselves. It was promised way back in the book of Ezekiel. Look at this passage of Scripture. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. Ezekiel chapter 36. I'll give you a new heart. I'll put a new spirit in you. And I'll put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees. And you'll be careful to keep my laws. I will save you from your uncleanness. That's revolutionary. Stop focusing on the outside to make yourself right. No, God says, if you only let me, I, I, I will do it. See how he says, I will, over and over and over again in that verse we just read? I will do this work. Deep down inside, I will cleanse you. I'll give you a new heart. So here's warning number three. Regardless of how hard you try, you'll never fix your life from the outside in. But this warning basically in Scripture comes with a promise. Only Jesus can change your life from the inside out. Now in 1 Corinthians 6, there's a similar list of sins that are listed for what you find here in Mark chapter 7. You'll see that there's some of them that sort of compare and and cross over with one another. Let me read this passage, but it has a little catch at the end. Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, thieves, greedy, those who habitually are drunk, verbal abusers, swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. But then he says this, such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, that means made holy, you were justified, you were made right with God, you were changed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God. Jesus changed you from the inside out. John Cocorn was an interesting person. During grade school, he never learned to read or write, but he caused a lot of trouble, and somehow he kept getting promoted to the next grade. He got to high school, and he mastered new skills. He says, I started cheating by turning in other people's paper. I dated the valedictorian, ran around with college prep kids. I couldn't read words, but I could read the system, and I read people. He graduated. He received a scholarship, athletic scholarship, to Texas Western College, and he cheated his way through there as well, getting a degree in education of all things. Somehow he got a job as a teacher, and for the next 17 years, he couldn't read or write. He's a teacher. For the next 17 years, he taught in high school without being able to do those basic skills. He says, what I did was I created an oral and visual environment. There wasn't the written word in there. I always had two or three teachers' assistants in each class to do board work or the bulletin board or whatever it was. Finally, he left teaching and he became a real estate developer. And later in life, he learned to read and write and became an advocate for better educational systems. It's an amazing story. It's almost unbelievable. 
The problem is, in a sense, we're all like John Cochran. Most of us don't have to fake reading and writing, but we live our lives like these religious leaders trying to persuade ourselves and persuade other people and persuade God himself that everything's all right. But deep down inside, though, there's a growing awareness that it's not true. There's something desperately wrong. And the good news, Jesus has the answer for that. The Bible says if anyone's in Jesus Christ, they become a new creation. The old is gone. The new is here. New from the inside out. Has that happened to you? Have you let Jesus make you a new creation? Have you placed your trust and faith in Jesus, turned in repentance from the sin in your life, and been baptized into him, receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit? to change you from the inside out? If not, I just want to invite you to experience that miracle of salvation. Your life now and for all eternity depends on what's happening in your heart. It doesn't depend on you being religious, making yourself right, good, happy, successful on the outside, but on accepting Jesus Christ and allowing him to totally transform you from the inside out. Have you? Will you? I like the way someone put it. When I look at myself, sometimes I have to confess, what a sinner. But when I look at Jesus, I proclaim what a Savior. And he is. Let's pray.